Now we're going to begin a study of one of Nietzsche's very early and major works, The Birth of Tragedy. And like I put up here, uh, it's coming out in 1871. He's worked over it over 1870 and 1871, um, time of crisis. And we're going to spend quite a few different sessions looking at this particular work because it's, it's rather complex. There's a lot of ideas being poured out within it. Um, their relations to each other are not as simple as they might appear at first. So what I'm going to do in this, this particular video is um, give you a little bit of introduction, talk about some of the easy misinterpretations that, that people often make when they're approaching this for the first time and how to avoid those. And then we're going to start digging into some of the real meat of the work. We're going to look at the opposition uh, and the confluence of the Dionysian and the Apollonian, as Nietzsche is describing them. We're going to look at Nietzsche's take on Greek poetry and artwork. And then we're going to begin, we're not actually going to get to the bottom of it, we're going to begin to look at his interpretation of Greek tragedy, which he thinks is absolutely central. And he thinks has implications not only for classical studies, for history, for you know, a humanities-based look at the past, he thinks it has great implications for his present and future, and I would say uh, as well for our present and future. So, um, what do we need to say about the work first off? Well, I thought it would be kind of useful to look at what Nietzsche himself says about it. And he's, he's, um, he's making rather qualified remarks about his own work in this case uh, about 15 years later. Um, one of the things that he says about it is that it's poorly written, heavy-handed, embarrassing. And that's, you know, understandable. Um, artists, uh, novelists, poets, painters, um, philosophers, historians, you know, many of us are, are embarrassed by our, our first works. Um, and, you know, there's, there's an old expression. I remember this coming across this when I was uh, working on my dissertation, which I never published, by the way. I have the same sort of experience, except I didn't publish my work. Um, somebody said to me, the only good dissertation is a dissertation that's actually finished, that's done. And it's only good because you, you've uh, used it as a sort of battleground for ideas or a sort of artist's workplace. You know, it's daubed with paint everywhere. Um, or you use it as a set of preliminary studies for what you're going to do afterwards. And this is rather important, you know, when it comes to the life of the mind, just like the life of technology, or the life of sports or performance or anything like that, our first efforts are usually not our best performances. So Nietzsche is looking back at this and saying, it lacks logical nicety, and is so sure of its message it dispenses with any kind of proof. Worse than that, it suspects the very notion of proof being a book written for initiates, a music for men christened in the name of music and held together by special aesthetic experiences, a shibboleth for the highbrow confraternity. Um, so, you know, he's, he's not entirely happy with what he's got here. And this work is quite a bit different from later works that he's going to write. Um, but he also does put his finger on some of the really key themes, and, you know, well, he should. He is the one who wrote this book, right? He says, um, how are we to define the Dionysiac spirit? In my book, I answer that question with the authority of the adept or disciple. Today, taking the, talking of the matter today, I would doubtless use more discretion, less eloquence. Um, now, after he does that sort of self-deprecation, he says, one of the cardinal questions here is that of the Greek attitude towards pain, towards suffering. What kind of sensibility did these people have? Was that sensibility constant, or did it change from generation to generation? Should we attribute the ever-increasing desire of the Greeks for beauty in the form of banquets, ritual ceremonies, new cults, to some fundamental lack? A melancholy disposition, perhaps, or an obsession with pain? Or is their commitment to the tragic myth, image of all that is awful, evil, perplexing, destructive, ominous, and human experience? Um, what, in short, made the Greek mind turn to tragedy? A sense of euphoria, maybe, sheer exuberance, reckless health and power? 
But in that case, what is the significance of that DNC Act frenzy which gave rise to tragedy and comedy alike? Can frenzy be viewed as something that is not a symptom of decay, disorder, overripeness? Is there such a thing? Let alienists answer that question. As a neurosis arising from health, from the youthful condition of the race? So he's, he's posing these really central questions. Um, every society, every great literature, every um, culture that begins to reflect on itself and to pour itself out, to unfold itself and develop tensions within itself, has to grapple with certain fundamental issues. And these aren't just, you know, metaphysical issues like, you know, what is everything made of, or, you know, what's the difference between appearance and reality, um, not just ethical questions like what should we head towards, what is our ultimate good, um, not just political questions like how should society be organized, what is justice, but also with what Nietzsche here is posing as aesthetic questions, um, usually when we think of aesthetics, we think of, you know, beauty, art, all that sort of stuff. What is art? What is beauty? Um, Nietzsche conceives of these things as what should our response be to life, to the nature of reality. Aesthetics, ethics, metaphysics are not neatly disentanglable from each other for a thinker like Nietzsche. And the reason why they're not is because he thinks for the ancient Greeks, they weren't as well, not in any true sense. And once you start to disentangle, say, ethics or moral uh, theory from these other things, you actually make it less than what it was. You deprive it of something. Um, so when they're mixed in together is when they actually have their, their greatest uh, efficacy, you might say. There's a few other things I, I want to read from later on in the, the work. Um, actually, just two things sort of set the tone. Um, after he's talked not only about the Apollonian and the Dionysian, but about something else which we're going to, we're going to look at much more closely in, in later sessions, the uh, Socratic or Alexandrian response, he says, in age after age, the same phenomenon Occurs. Over and over, the avid will finds means to maintain and perpetuate its creatures in life by spreading over existence the blandishments of illusion. We're going to see why those themes are so important. One man is enthralled by a zest for knowledge and is persuaded he can staunch the eternal wound of being with its help. Another is a big beguiled by a veil of art which flutters tantalizing before his eyes. Yet another is buoyed up by the metaphysical solace that life flows on indestructible beneath the whirlpool of appearances. Um, these are three major responses. One is the Socratic, one is the Apollonian, one is the Dionysian. Then he goes on, he says, not to mention even commoner and more powerful illusions which the will holds in readiness at any moment. Uh, the three kinds of illusion I have named answer only to noble natures who resent the burden of existence more deeply than the rest and who therefore require special beguilements to make them forget this burden. What we call culture is entirely composed of such beguilements. So, this is a very important point. And I'm going to come back to that in just one moment. The other thing that I want to read, Nietzsche makes a contrast here between um, a sort of Aryan or Indo-European way of looking at things. This is part of what lent him to, lent his works to being appropriated by um, the National Socialist later on, but we can, we can sort of strip it away from this. Think of these as sort of ideal types. He says, um, what distinguishes the Aryan conception of not the fall, which he sees as Semitic, but as sort of the primal crime, the primal uh, trauma or tearing of what distinguishes the Aryan conception is an exalted notion of active sin as the properly Promethean virtue. This notion provides us with the ethical substratum of pessimistic tragedy, which comes to be seen as a justification of human ills, that is to say, of human guilt, as well as the suffering purchased by that guilt. Um, he's, again, he's contrasting this to the, the you know, Semitic, um, biblical understanding of the fall of 
human beings. Or even, you know, later on you could say the fall of the devil and then it's transposition into that, that, um, that artistic production. The tragedy at the heart of things, he says, which the thoughtful Aryan is not disposed to quibble away, the contrariety at the center of the universe is seen by him as an interpenetration of several worlds. This is a thing, this is a point worth sort of lingering over. For Nietzsche, reality is complex, dynamic, active, and it involves forces not just interpenetrating each other, but in tension with each other, overcoming each other, transforming into each other, sometimes subordinating the other, transforming it, and clashing with each other. And what is right is not given in some sort of panoptic view from above that covers everything. It has to develop out of this, this ferment between different perspectives, different commitments, different, you might even say movements or ways of, of being and living. So he says, there's a contrariety at the center of the universe. There, there's a chaos, not in the sense of everything being totally indistinct and not being able to make any sense of it. You might think of it as rather saying there's too much sense for it all to make sense together, and so it has to battle it out. Uh, and this is a very different notion of the, uh, the fundamental basis of the universe and of good and evil than that which we see, say, in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, or even in Neoplatonism, philosophically. Um, Nietzsche is articulating something that is, in many ways, more like um, the Babylonian way of, of looking at things. Interestingly enough, Babylonians are semi. But if you look at the Enuma Elish and the representation of, of things there, the imposition um, by, by Marduk of order upon things, order that wasn't originally there, had to be imposed, requires force, um, requires coercion, the generation of human beings not uh, made in the image of God, but in order to serve the gods so that the gods don't have to war with each other because they're so, so powerful. Um, human beings, instead of being made out of, out of dust and the breath of God, being made out of the blood of a sacrificed God. Um, these are all very much in line with what Nietzsche is talking about in terms of this Promethean area where it's not so much sin as crime, which is the, the central moral category that's being used. So um, let's now, after we've sort of set the stage for this, let's look now at a few common misunderstandings that, that occur with respect to this. What we have going on in this book is this constant opposition between the DNC and the Apollonian. Oftentimes, I've observed this many times taking place in classes, in reading groups, when people come to this book for the first time, uh, because Nietzsche is such a great thinker and not just a, a, an intellectual, um, metaphysical, philosoph you know, philosophical thinker, great at arranging things in categories and saying, here's how it leads to this and that, but he's also an artist. He's also a rhetorician, he's also a metaphor coiner and, and developer. Because he's so good at that, it's very easy to be seduced into thinking that this book is only about these two things, and that what Nietzsche is providing you here is a metaphysics in which it's either this or this. Um, so I want to go over a few sort of ground, you can call them ground rules if you want, or maybe key ideas for, for interpreting this work. And this is coming about after you know, reading through the whole work and thinking about this many, many times over the last uh, roughly 20 years. Um, and like I said, seeing other people you know, sort of oversimplify things. Think of it this way. Well, the Dionysian and the Apollonian are responses to Reality. And reality for Nietzsche is not what we typically represent.
represents it as. Uh, our representations, by being representations, are already sort of a departure from reality and yet, an inter yet a further intervention, you know, mixing the stuff up within reality. But what is reality like fundamentally? There is discord. There is ferment. There is conflict. There is exuberance. Everything that goes with life. When you ask, what is the point of life? By the time that you actually begin to ask that question, you're already you know, several stages removed from bare life by itself, generating, pulsing, moving, eating, drinking, copulating, reproducing, fighting, all these sorts of things, um, desire. And reality itself is, is for Nietzsche, this, this massive just flux constantly of beings which are coming into being and going out of being, and which are you know, attacking and cooperating with each other, which are you know, enjoying each other, being bothered by each other. And he also talks about this in terms of affect. Nietzsche is a great student of how the affect or the emotional or the desirous part of ourselves uh, reveals to us truth, reality, what's going on, uh, all those sorts of things that we would normally look to for, you know, in, in the intellect or in science or, you know, in abstraction. Um, now, the Dionysian is a response to this reality. It's a response. It's not only the response. And it does, it responds in part by mimicking that reality, by mastering it, in a sense, by becoming part of it, or letting itself become, yet once again, part of it, by losing itself. But that doesn't mean that the Dionysian by itself is that underlying reality that is yet further more foundational than uh, the Dionysian response. The Apollonian response is to produce order, form, differentiation, stability, um, to impose those things, to seduce into those things, to tell a story rather than, you know, if you want to use a Shakespearean phrase that um, gets used by Faulkner to tell a story that is not a tale told by an idiot signifying nothing, which is you know the constant thread of the Dionysian, but to tell a story that seems to have a point that you can articulate, that you can put your finger on. Not necessarily a point that makes sense out of everything all by itself in a philosophical, systematic way, because that's a third response. And beyond both of these two, there's another response to this, is what gets called um, the Socratic or Alexandrian response. And this is something quite different. But it's also something real. Um, so it's not just a matter of either Dionysian or Apollonian. There's actually a third term, and there's actually a fourth term. Like I you know, mentioned in that, that passage that I um, quoted, um, the, uh, here we go. Um, in age after age, the same phenomenon occurs over and over. The avid will finds means to maintain and perpetuate its creatures in life by spreading over existence the blandishments of illusion. Not to mention, he says, even commoner and more powerful illusions which the will holds in readiness at any moment. So, you know, losing oneself, say, in consumerist culture, um, a common response in our own time, might, from a Nietzschean perspective, and we'll explore this a little bit later on, that might not be Dionysian, that might not be Apollonian, that might not even be Socratic or Alexandrian, that might, in fact, I think it probably actually is, its own type of 
response, a in some way more superficial response, one that is less noble. Uh, there's a nobility to this, even though Nietzsche is so firmly against this and says, this is what ruined tragedy. This is what's screwing things up even now. Nietzsche recognizes a nobility in this. So there are other responses to the problem of life, to the problem of making sense out of things, which um, don't fit into this schema. The other thing that I want to point out is that the, uh, there's a temptation quite often after having read this book to want to see things, you know, leaving out the, this other stuff, to want to see things only in terms of an opposition between Apollonian and Dionysiac. Uh, this is a big problem because if you do that, you're going to, first off, miss the central point of what this book is about, which is that tragedy, Greek tragedy, when it's working well, actually fuses the two of these together. And it doesn't, so, it doesn't do that just by, you know, a uh, dash of this and a dash of this, or, you know, a pound of this mixed in with a pound of this. They actually affect each other in fairly complex ways. Um, so, it's a mistake to say, well, everything is either Dionysiac or it's Apollonian. Now let's go around trying to identify which is which. That, in fact, if, if you want to get down to it, it, that would actually be much more like a Socratic response or one of those lower responses that uh, Nietzsche is, is criticizing. That would not actually be a Dionysian or Apollonian response. So it wouldn't be true to his work. Um, there's also a danger not just with tragedy, but with all the other things that he's, he's talking about in thinking that any of them are purely Dionysian or purely Apollonian, uh, because he doesn't say that. He actually sees um, things that are that are sort of at a limit condition of being purely Dionysian and sort of like falling back into that chaos. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So, you know, I see the same thing being done anytime that we have a nice um, dualistic sort of philosophical way of categorizing things. You know, another great example of this, more contemporary examples in media studies with Marshall McLuhan when they talk about hot media and cold media or cool media. Right? As soon as somebody starts reading those, those books, they don't uh, pay attention to what you know, McLuhan is, is saying about some of these things. And they go around and they say, well, that's hot, that's cool. Or if we look at the difference between speech and writing. You know, people read Derrida, or people read Plato's uh, Phaedrus, or they read other things, you know, Walter Ong, or any of these other people who talk about the difference between oral and written cultures. And immediately they want to go around and identify, well, that's oral, that's uh, written. And there is kind of a fun, you know, side to categorizing things. But the reason why we want to categorize is so that we can wrap our heads around them. We don't want to categorize just for the sake of doing that, because that turns into um, kind of a pointless exercise. That certainly, that sort of categorization, that ain't going to help you deal with the problem of life. So. Nietzsche is using these, these concepts, Dionysian and Apollonian, as tools, as categories, but not as uh, entirely exclusive, diametrically opposed categories that then allow us to, to understand everything uh, solely in terms of their opposition. So let's now actually look at, I'm going to move this over a little bit. We have a little bit more room on the board. Let's look at his characterizations of the Dionysian and the Apollonian. Um, so let's look first at what he says about nature. Human beings emerge from, from nature, from the world. And we're a creature, um, we're a being, we're an organism, and we're, we're different than other ones. We're in, in certain ways more complex than, than the other ones, but we are in continuity with them for somebody like Nietzsche. Um, the first distinction that he, he brings about is talking about the difference between
intoxication and dream. These are, for, for Nietzsche, not only psychological or spiritual, but even physiological things that, that occur, phenomena that we can, we can note, that we can relate to. Um, and he says, in spelling this out, let us begin by viewing them as the separate art realms of dream, Apollonia, and intoxication. It was in a dream, according to Lucretius, that the marvelous gods and goddesses first presented themselves to the mind of man. Um, and you know, dreams, visions, that sort of stuff. You actually see this in uh, not just ancient poetry, but also in ancient philosophy and wisdom literature and that sort of thing as well. That great sculptor Phidias beheld in a dream the entrancing bodies of more than human beings. And likewise, if anyone asked the Greek poets about the mystery of poetic creation, they too would have referred him to dreams and instructed him. The fair illusion of the dream sphere and the production of which every man proves himself an accomplished artist. I mean, that's something worth thinking about there, that little point. We're not all great artists. Um, we're not all great with, you know, arranging words and phrases and metaphors and rhymes, you know, into poetry. We're not all great at, at painting or drawing. I know I've tried my hand at it. My stuff is awful. Uh, we're, not great, uh, we're not all great musicians. Um, I'm not going to spare you my stories about that. Uh, but when it comes to our imaginary life, our dreaming, by being the kind of creature that we are, we all have these capacities. And we can form incredible sets of images. So, he says, um, here we enjoy an immediate apprehension of form, of shapes, all shapes speak to us directly. Nothing seems indifferent or redundant. So, in addition to dream, we should also think imagination. Um, despite the high intensity with which these dream realities exist for us, we still have a res residual sensation that they are illusions. And the frequency, not to say normality, of the experience is borne out in the passage of many poets. Um, so we, we have dreams, and, and we not only have you know, vision in them, we have affective connections to the things that we're dreaming about. We feel about them as well. Even if it's just the sense, yes, this is the right proportion. These things are the way they want to be. Uh, and it's an illusion. Um, now he says here, he, he says, the perfection of these conditions in contrast to our imperfectly understood waking reality, there's sort of a, a to, the, to the imaginary or to the dream, there's a consistency, a coherence that is actually lacking in our, our ordinary experience of reality. Um, that's one of the things that illusion brings. Illusion brings the possibility of wholeness, of things being in, in perfect harmony, making sense. The perfection of these conditions furnishes a symbolic analog to the soothsaying uh, faculty and quite generally to the arts, which make life possible and worth living. This is a fundamental response. Nietzsche thinks that just on a, on a physiological, bodily, psychical level, why do we dream? Why do we imagine? Because that enables us to deal with life. That heals us. So, the Apollonian is really something rooted in our nature and how we respond to the rest of reality. It says, the image of Apollo must incorporate that thin line which the dream image may not cross under penalty of becoming pathological imposing itself on us as a crass reality. A discreet limitation of freedom from all extravagant urges. The sapient tranquility of the plastic God. Um, one of the things that we're going to see going along with this is also restraint. Limits. If the dream is going to be successful, there's certain things that should not occur within the dream, like posing, is this a dream? Because then that begins to jumble things back into chaos again. But what about int intoxication? Um, 
Well, one of the things that Nietzsche talks about here is the principium individu individuationis, the principle of individuation, of separation of beings apart from each other. What is it that makes me, me, and you, you, rather than you know us being fused together, being the same thing, being sort of an incoherently distinguished mass, the principle of individuation. Something allows us to be different from each other. That falls on the side of the Apollonian. The Apollonian, by the way it works, imposes that. Um, but while, there, while we are separate beings, we are also not separate beings. We are also beings who are together in this world, and the world is not just me, it is not just you, it is not just all these other things. It's all of us together, and there's a sense in which the loss of, of that unity gnaws at us, at human beings. So he says, um, If we add to this awe the glorious transport which arises in man, even from the very depths of nature, at the shattering of the Principium Individuationis, then we are in a position to apprehend the essence of Dionysiac rapture. So, another good term to think of, rapture. This is ecstatic in a way that is fundamentally different than, than this over here whose closest analogy is provided by physical intoxication. Dionysiac stirrings arise either through the influence of those narcotic potions of which all primitive races speak in their, their hymns. Um, this is actually a worth, you know, very short digression. Just about every culture that has um, developed past, you know, just hunting gathering, even some of the hunter gatherers to some degree, they very quickly figure out how to make something that will put them in a different state. They usually figure out how to ferment something. So nearly everybody has got something that they manage. And fermentation is really spoiling. It's, it's, in a way, it's fermentation is very Dionysiac. You're taking things and you're letting other things affect them and produce new things out of them. And even just think about a fermenting um, uh, carboy of beer. You have all this bubbling taking place. You know. um, just about every culture figures out how to make something that will intoxicate you. Oftentimes, quite a few things. And then they begin to use it. And then they begin to experience something new. Reality in a different way. It's very important to remember Dionysus, the Dionysiac. Dionysus is the god of wine, the god of intoxication, the god of frenzy. Um, so, Dionysiac stirrings arise through the influence of those narcotic potions or through we can have a response that's Dionysiac without even taking anything. When people talk about, I'm high on life. Well, that would be something like this. Or through the powerful approach of spring, which penetrates with joy the whole frame of nature. Um, many of us are so detached from the natural world and we're able to shut it out in so many different ways. Um, or to, to, to only take tiny little portions of it, that it's hard for us to sense this. I remember the very first time that I taught a comparative religion class, and I was teaching about um, uh, primal religions, and we were talking about you know, the, the sky being a god. Fortunately, I was in a place that actually had you know, a very good view. I took my class outside, and I had them for just five minutes just look up. And if you actually spend the time to do that, and you look at just the immensity of what you're surrounded by. And then you start to notice things going on. Flights of birds, the way clouds move, the wind, all those sorts of natural occurrences. When you don't simply take those for granted anymore, then you can actually start to have some sort of sense of what nature was like for those you know, in the past from whom we're removed by our technologically influenced environment. Uh, the coming of spring is a passional event. For us, it's just a calendar date. And we often grumble, you know, uh, you know put at the wrong time, shouldn't be this, this particular date. Um, it means something for ancient peoples. It means something for those who are not detached from, from nature. 
and it can produce a kind of intoxication. There are all sorts of other things that can do that as well. So he says, so stirred the individual forgets himself completely. So, forgetting the individual. Another way to forget the individual is through identification. with the all. Whereas, over here, the individual is marked out. But there's also the possibility of identification. So, he says, um, it's, he talks of he's giving a comparison here. It's the same Dionysiac power which in medieval Germany drove ever increasing crowds of people singing and dancing from place to place. And that's another important aspect of this as well. How is this revealed? Through song, through dance, through music. And we're going to get to what kind of music in just a moment. Um, the Bacchic choruses of the Greeks had their precursors in Asia Minor, and as far back as Babylon, the orgiastic Psyche. And he says, there are people who, either from lack of experience or out of sheer stupidity, turn away from such phenomena, strong in the sense of their own sanity, label them either mockingly or pittingly endemic diseases as primitive, and they want to reject that sort of thing. But, um, for the Dionysiac, this is actually being more in touch with reality rather than being out of touch with it. So he says, not only does the bond between man and man come to be forged once more by the magic of the Dionysiac rite, but nature itself, long alienated or subjected, rises again to celebrate the reconciliation with her prodigal son, man, human beings. Um, so one of the things that's taking place through the Dionysiac is the, reuni the reunification of human beings with each other, with their own nature, grasping what they are, as parts of the natural world. Um, and he's got some you know, great examples of this, which I'm actually going to skip over. Um, one thing I do want to say is, he, or read from here, man now expresses himself through song and dance as the member of a higher community. He has forgotten how to walk, how to speak, and is on the brink of taking, taking wing as he dances. Um, so what, what, what's occurring here? There's, again, this identification through intoxication, through an ecstatic being outside of oneself. And Nietzsche says something really important here. No longer the artist, he has himself become a work of art. The productive power of the whole universe is now manifested in his transport to the glorious satisfaction of the primordial one. So, now Nietzsche in the, in the next section says, look, we've looked at nature now. Both of these are necessary for human beings. Both of them are used by human beings. What about art? What about how that plays itself out? Um, we've, we've examined these as the product of formative forces arising directly from nature without the mediation of the human artist. Once you mix in the human artist, and this happens very, very early, already in our, our history, right? Once you mix in the artist, now things go up to a higher level. Because artistry can, among other things, it can involve the DNS Act or it can involve the Apollonian. It can reproduce them. It can take them to a higher power. So he says, at this stage, artistic urges are satisfied directly on the one hand through the imagery of dreams, whose perfection is quite independent of the intellectual rank, the artistic development of the individual. On the other hand, through an ecstatic reality which once again takes no account of the individual and may even destroy him or else redeem him through a mystical experience of the collective. Now, what happens with the artist? He says, 
Having set down these general principles and distinctions, we now return to the Greeks in order to realize what degree the formative forces of nature were developed in them. This will allow us to assess the relation of the Greek artist to his prototypes, or to use Aristotle's expression, his imitation of nature. Because art, art has been conceived of as an imitation of nature from Plato, from Aristotle, running throughout Western culture, not as by itself being the way in which human beings participate in and contribute to nature. Although you can see a strain of that, ironically, you know, the, Nietzsche is very clearly anti-Christian. You do see a strain of this, how human beings could participate in nature and its redemption or in its unfolding in some Christian thought. I just want to put that as a aside because we, we don't want to, you know, go too far away from, from Nietzsche. Um, now, there's one other thing that he says before we go into the artist that's very important. He says, there's another point about which we do not have to conjecture at all. There's a profound gap, he says, separating the Dionysiac Greeks from the Dionysiac barbarians. Again, this goes to that point of not every Dionysian thing is the same. And if you try to have the Dionysian unmediated with nothing else there, you actually end up, you might say, getting away from it or losing, losing grasp on it. He says, throughout the range of ancient civilizations, we find evidence of Dionysiac celebrations which stand to the Greek type in much the same relation as the bearded satyr stands to the god Dionysos. So there's, there's a connection of analogy there. Dionysos is the god. The satyr is just a stand-in to, to, or, or a spin-off or a reflection of that. The central concern of such celebrations was almost universally, it was Nietzsche, uh, you know, again, a complete sexual promiscuity overriding every form of established tribal law. All the savages urges the mind were unleashed on these occasions until they reached that paroxysm of lust and cruelty, which always struck me as the witch's cauldron par, par, par excellence. Um, well, I mean, you don't necessarily have to tie this in just with sexuality, you can tie this in with violence, with all the other things that, that have to do with libido and desire. Um, the point that he's making here is that when the Dionysian is just the Dionysian, it sort of wears itself out. It just produces these endless cycles of, okay, we're going to do things normally for a while, then boom, now everything you know, goes, goes crazy, and we run the bulls, or we uh, have carnival, or we you know have you know this big orgy over here, or pick whatever you like, you know. Um, but then after after that's occurred, you can say, well, what was the point? What did that actually provide? It may have provided moments where the, the divisions between things were, were broken down, and everybody felt good for a while, and it may in fact be needed corrected every so often just to keep things on, on course. But there's not much to learn from it. It's only with Greeks, where the Dionysian is tied in with the Apollonian, as he puts it. Uh, who, what kept Greek, Greeks safe was the proud, imposing image of Apollo, who, holding up the head of the Gorgon to those brutal and grotesque Dionysiac forces, subdued them. Doric art has immortalized Apollo's majestic, majestic rejection of all license. Uh, and, he, and he says, you know, this actually breaks down at certain points in the Greek, um, Greek history as well. So he says um, that active pacification represents the most important event in the history of Greek ritual. The two great antagonists, Dionysos and Apollo, have been reconciled. Each feels obligated henceforth to keep his bounds. So you only really, according to Nietzsche, you only really have the Apollonian and the Dionysiac working to their full potential, being fully what they can be, unfolding, uh, unpacking themselves all the way, if there's actually a creative tension running between the two of them, a wedge, you might say, running 
between them, and, and one of the questions that you could ask here that Nietzsche himself does not ask is, okay, who imposes this wedge? He says that Apollo you know, holds up the Gorgon's head, which is what you know, freezes things to stone to the Dionysian. Does that mean that the Apollonian imposes this completely? But the Apollonian itself has to respect that. What conditions the Apollonian to actually respect that as well? And why should the Dionysian respond to that instead of just saying, I'll find some way around you. And screw you, I'm not going to, to let you freeze me into place. There's maybe something else going on here that's not fully articulated. And I just leave that open as a, a question to you to think about. Let's go back to, to the, these two categories now. Um, and let's think now about um, the artist, as, as he says. So, um, he starts out talking about music. And he says, in every exuberant joy, there's heard an undertone of terror, or else a wistful lament over an irrecoverable loss. That's the Dionysiac. It's as though in these Greek festivals, a sentimental trait of nature were coming to the fore, as though nature were bemoaning the fact of her fragmentation, her decomposition into separate individuals. That's, again, very Dionysian. The chants and gestures of these revelers, so ambiguous in their motivation, represented an absolute novum in the world of the Homeric Greeks. Their Dionysiac music spread a broad terror and a deep shudder. So there's a Dionysian way of doing music. The Greeks, like he said, had already been familiar with the Apollonian type of music. He says, music had long been familiar to the Greeks as an Apollonian art, as a regular beat, like that of waves lapping along the shore. Think about what music is. It is actually regularity. That's why music could, in fact, later on in the Middle Ages, become one of the, the uh, quadrivium, the, the liberal arts that had to do with what? With mathematics. There's a relation between music and mathematics. One that's already noted uh, by Pythagoras and by, by Plato, by, by Aristotle. Um, that's very Apollonian, isn't it? So he says, um, Apollo's music was a Doric architecture of sound of barely hinted sounds, such as are proper to the kithra, a type of, a type of essentially uh, harp, think of it that way, strings that are, are not played all at the same time, but, but in, in turn. Those very elements which characterize Dionysiac music, and after it music quite generally, the heart-shaking power of tone, the uniform stream of melody, the incomparable resources of harmony, all these elements have been carefully kept at a distance as being inconsonant with the Apollonian norm. So, there's two different types of music going on, and eventually, which is going to win out? It's going to be the Dionysiac type of, of music. So, he says, um, the Apollonian Greek being confronted with, with Dionysiac uh, phenomena uh, must have looked upon this with some degree of surprise. And that surprise would have been further increased as they later, later realized with a shudder that all this was not so alien to him, that his Apollonian consciousness was but a thin veil hiding from him a whole Dionysiac realm. So again, both of these are together. The Greek, who has made sense out of the world, the classic Greek, by the Apollonian, still has this going on within him or her because they're a human being, because this is part of what it is to be a human being in the world. You can't all be, uh, you know, air and light and uh, quiet, tinkling music and slow, measured movements and not too much. There has to be this other side as well. So he says, in order to comprehend this, we have to take down the Apollonian edifice, the culture, stone by stone until we discover its foundation. So we have to deconstruct the Apollonian. Um, he says, at first the eye is struck by the marvelous shapes of the Olympian gods. Um, the fact that among them we find Apollo is one god among many should not mislead us. The same drive that found its most complete representation of Apollo generated the whole Olympian world. 
And in this sense, we may consider Apollo the father of that world. So the mythology, which, you know, if you walk in times, we represent Greek mythology as if, well, this was their religion. And we think about it as sort of like going to temples, going to church. Um, but these were actually quite different. And the Greek contact with their own religion came in part through stories, many of which were not written down until later, but even more through artistic production, through statues, through architecture, through rituals. And out of those rituals come tragedy and other poetry, uh, also through epic. So the Greeks are encountering their gods through the medium of human productions that are providing these things to them. And those are human productions of primarily Apollonian uh, sort of nature. So he says, what was the radical need out of which that illustrious society of Olympian beings sprang? And he says, whoever approaches the Olympians with a different religion in his heart. So if we're looking at them in a somewhat anachronistic way, we tend to want religion to be something um, either terrible or something perfect uh, if, you know, in our society. Uh, or we just want to be left alone by it, um, some people. But usually that's because they, they consider it you know, something that they, they would not like. He says, whoever approaches the Olympians with a different religion in his heart, seeking moral elevation, sanctity, spirituality, loving kindness, will be forced to turn away from them in ill humor disappointment. And if you, you know, if you read your stories of the Greek gods, they were screw-ups in a lot of ways, weren't right? they? They're fighting with each other, cheating on each other, playing tricks, um, sometimes trying to kill each other off, um, being jealous, being uh, angry, um, raping mortals, seducing mortals, um, screwing up people's lives, producing wars, all sorts of things like that, right? Um, so he says, nothing in these deities reminds us of asceticism, high intellect, or duty. We're confronted by a luxuriant, triumphant existence, which deifies the good and bad indifferently. That's something really critical when it comes to the Apollonian. That's something which is going to distinguish it from the later thing that we're going to talk about as the Socratic or Alexandrian. What's being individuated, what's being represented, is not being put forward as being perfect in a moral sense. Like he says, um, we're confronted by a luxury triumphant existence, which, de which deifies the good and the bad. Take Zeus, for example. Zeus is supposed to be you know, pretty good in, in, in a lot of respects. He's the protector of travelers. He's the one who cares for those whose you know, rights are being transgressed, so you better watch out because otherwise Zeus might get you if, you, you know, if you're abusing the poor, the widow, the orphan. Um, and at the same time, he's got no problem cheating on his wife, um, hiding all these things from her, raising children, all sorts of other children. Um, you know, he's, he's a morally ambivalent character, you could say. Um, He says, the Olympian magic mountain opens itself to us, showing its very roots. What are the roots of this? The Greeks were keenly aware of the terrors and horrors of existence. In order to be able to live at all, they had to place before them the, uh, the shining fantasy of the Olympians. Their tremendous distrust of the titanic forces of nature, Moira, or fate, mercilessly enthroned beyond the knowable world, the vulture which fed upon the great philanthropist Prometheus, terrible lot drawn by wise Odysseus. Um, you know, because of Freud, we often think of Odysseus as ah, just that guy who wanted to you know, kill his dad and, and sleep with his mom. Odysseus was a wise man who suffered adversity, triumphed over it, ruled the land wisely, you know, produced great things, but this, this horrible thing occurred to him without him even understanding it, without choosing it, but in a certain sense being wrapped up in it and being able, being able to avoid it. That's more Dionysian, right? The Apollonian arises as a needed response to that sort of uh, thing that's going to happen. So he says, in order to live at all, the Greeks had to construct these deities. The Apollonian need for beauty had to develop the Olympian hierarchy of joy. This is a beautiful expression. 
The Hierarchy of Joy by slow degrees from the original Titanic Hierarchy of Terror. What does he mean there? Well, look at what happened before the Olympian gods. What led up to them? You have the Titans, right? And even before them, you have Uranus, who is, you know, just this crazy Dionysiac, destructive, uh, you know, father sky force, right? And then, you know, you have Kronos, the father of at least, you know, six of the Olympian gods. Uh, and what does Kronos do? Kronos had actually, um, you know, castrated his own father and taken power. Um, that's not an Apollonian sort of thing. That's a pretty Dionysiac sort of thing. Um, and he swallows his own children because there's a prophecy that one of his children will you know, replace him. So he swallows them alive. Again, you know, horrible things, right? Um, the other titans, how are they represented? You know, there's these hundred-handed ones. There's Prometheus. There's Epimetheus. There's, all, there's Atlas. There's all these great forces. Well, the Apollonian Olympian gods provide you something out of that. And they don't, you know, completely erase that. They replace it. So he says, the gods justified human life. How do they justify human life? Another beautiful phrase by Nietzsche. By living it themselves. By doing it in a higher way. He, and Nietzsche calls this the only satisfactory theodicy ever invented. What is a theodicy? It comes from the Greek words for God, theos, and uh, way or, or method or type of structured way of doing it, hodos, rope, literally. And a theodicy is a justification of the ways of God. So when people you know, say, I don't understand why God does this sort of stuff, why he lets this happen, if you try to provide an explanation for that, you're providing a theodicy. What are the Greeks providing with these stories of the, of the Olympian gods? They are providing a theodicy. They are providing something that allows people to say, okay, maybe I don't fully understand everything, but at least this is a good story, and I feel better now. Um, and I feel better now because I'm actually able to like look at this, hear this, imagine this, think about this, inject myself there. Um, and he says, Now it became possible to stand the wisdom of Salinas on its head and proclaim it was the worst evil of man to die soon and the second worst for him to die at all. Because Salinas had said, and this is Dionysian, best thing for you would have been to never been born, second best would have been to die young, um, to Midas. So, it says, um, it should have become apparent by now that the harmony with nature which we latecomers regard such nostalgia is by no means a simple and inevitable condition to be found at the gateway to every culture, a kind of paradise. Uh, modern, modern human beings have misconstrued what goes on in, in primal cultures, which are essentially Dionysian, unless they're able to find some Apollonian way of, of dealing with and this is very vital. This is something which uh, is at the, the root of not only Greek tragedy, but every sort of cultural renewal in Nietzsche's view. Um, this is a good place to leave off for the moment. We've looked at these two different responses, the Apollonian and Dionysiac. We've looked at some of their interplay. We've looked at how they arise out of the nature of human beings, how they develop themselves, um, where the production, the artistic production by human beings of the Olympian gods comes in. And next we're actually going to turn to different kinds of artistry besides music. We're going to look at poetry and the other plastic arts, which are essentially uh, Apollonian poetry in some respects, some certain kinds of poetry is Dionysian. Then we're going to look at how tragedy fuses these together. So but that's what we're going to do in the next video.